Violence is not a way. I already wrote this sentence, um, let me check, 157 times. Despite McGonagall's affirmation that was past the age of detentions, she deemed appropriate to contradict it for this particular occasion. She cares after all. Not at all pleasant how she decides to show it. She yelled quite a lot before to enchain me to this desk until natural death will free me. But, well, it gave me a twisted sense of warmth. The same, I had the stalking Davis two or three times over before the noise attracted people and I've been forced to stop. I officially have a new happy memory for my Patronus. Oh, come on, it was so totally deserved. And I mercifully didn't even eat him on the face, so I don't understand why all the fuss. I started with the purest and noblest of intentions, I swear. He is Ophelia's boyfriend, after all, a nice fellow, and I only wanted to understand how come a person with a huge capital bald L on his forehead and a snitch can attract her when I cannot. I only wanted to make a friend out of him. I promise. So, in an absolutely innocent and peaceful way, I presented myself to one of their gobstones meeting. Dear God, there is no limit to the debasement. And no, I don't mean me. I waited until everybody but him left. He's the... How do they call it? Captain? Well, until the King of Loserland was the only one left tidying up and everything, and I slipped silently inside the room without being seen. When just behind him, I exclaimed loudly, So! Making him jump out of his skin so much, he dropped all the stones he was collecting. Such a jumpy, clumsy fellow. When he turned around and saw me, despite my huge reassuring smile, he frowned darkly, and hastened to leave everything he was doing to shut up. What do you want? He asked, all defensive, while I only wanted to show him kindness. I shrugged. Fancy the chop? I said friendly. Carry on with your manly occupation, please. Don't let me disturb you. He scolded, getting back down to collect all the stones dispersed on the floor. I won't allow you to provoke me, I warn you, he muttered, like if I had any intention of the kind. And by the way, this is as manly as your stupid quidditch. See, he was the one provoking. But I went there with an olive branch and I didn't let the geekest of the geeks to get to me. I observed him while he was busy with his precious stones. So, I started again. Do you like Gobstone, don't you? He shot me a glance. May I say almost fearful? Apparently. Hmm, I murmured, interested. I wonder why. Silence from his part. Gobstone, hmm? I repeated, mulling over the word. I was about to repeat it again as a sudden inspiration struck my mind. Bizarre, this interest in spheric objects, I said with a sweet smile. Maybe that's why you like the game so much, I exclaimed, because you are completely devoid of something similar. He shot up, all flushed and offended, just because of a totally ludicrous affirmation. But then... He placed all the stones on the table, stood in front of me, challenging, and laughed. I might be without balls all right, but see, despite that, somebody likes it well enough to be nobbed by me, while, most unfortunately, won't grant the same favor to you. Violence was the only way. I'm breaking up with Moini. There isn't any point in keeping hanging out with her. We are spending the evening together in the Hogwarts ground, sitting on the pier, legs swinging lazily above the water. The sunset was just spectacular, 
colors so bright and intense they rendered me speechless with admiration. However, it wasn't the same for her. In fact, she inflicted me a long jabbering about a party she had been once. The dress she was wearing and everybody else too. I understood then there wasn't any point in cracking on. I was not expecting any poetry or profound disquisition on nature's beauty, but at least an appreciative silence would have been sufficient to convince me I could carry on still a few days, at least for the sake of the amazing shucks we have. But it isn't meant to be, so I'm ending it. It is revealing to be quite staggering and revelatory. And revelatory. I'm feeling pretty bad, which I never thought it would happen. Usually, in most of my breaking up, not being any feelings involved, it runs quite smoothly. They pretend to be upset a little because they ought to save appearance, but then no hard feelings and we are all the happier for it. It hasn't been the same with Moini. I told her my rare speech, used on countless of occasions, that she is amazing, but it is time to end it, we are not made for each other, and so on. Usually, I get back. From Hufflepuff, some fake tears. From Gryffindor, that I'm a bloody bastard and more often than not, a slap. From Ravenclaw, a clever turn of phrase that flips the whole thing and at the end is them who are chucking me. My favorite. From Slytherin, not much experience in that field, but something tells me that they would wait for me to turn my back and then jinx me. Never turn your back on a Slytherin. Mohini, as soon as understood the meaning of what I was saying, and it took her quite a long time to grasp it, started to fret in a pathetic way, tears dropping plenty. But why? She wails in a small voice, with two dove's eyes full of tears that, I promise you, made me almost take back my words. However, the sunset was still there, reminding me of the reasons of my choice. Because we are not made for each other, I repeat honestly, but somewhat stuttering, I must say. But I don't get it, she whines. I've always done whatever you asked me to. Oh God, now I feel a bloody bastard. I take her hand to try to calm down this deluge of tears. I know, and you have been great. But don't you see? We haven't got anything in common. You don't know anything about me. It's not true. We have plenty, and I know plenty about you. Like? I know you like Quidditch, and I do too. You find history of magic boring, and it's the same for me. I tell her off. Mohini, those things are not important. You don't even know me. We never really talk. Bah! She stammers, and down, another fresh pouring down. I fish a crumpled armchair from a pocket, and I start mopping gently her tears, feeling at this point very uncomfortable. I try, but you are always so silent, you never speak, so I chat to fill in. I'm taken aback. Am I silent? She nods, her hand grasping my arm and snuggling up against me. I ask you questions, but you never answer them. This sentence rings a bell, but I put it aside for the moment, trying to untangle myself from this pitiful situation. Mohini, I'm sorry, but this must end. You don't even like me. Of course I like you. No, you don't. You like me because I'm popular and everything, but you don't fancy me, really. She rises on me, two liquids beautiful and eager eyes, all her long curving eyelashes suffused with glimmering tears. But it is not true. I like you really. I love you really. My heart large a moment. I never heard those words mentioned to me and I never thought the first time would be from Mohini lips. She gets profit immediately from my visible staggering to press those perfect lips on mine. I love you. 
she repeats in a low voice, letting her hands free to express themselves, awakening straight away the only part of me that is more than satisfied with this relationship and doesn't want to end it. I must say, that part of my body tends to have the better on me on many occasions, and this might indeed prove to be one of them, especially because she may be deficient in many respects, but she knows how to use her charms. I'm almost about to throw my purpose to the wind and throw myself on air, but I remember to have also a brain somewhere and maybe I should use it. Therefore, using all my self-control, I stop her hands. You don't love me, Mohini. You think you do, but you don't. I say, keeping her pretty wrist in my hands. But I do! She says, trying to kiss me again. Why do you think you love me? I ask, dodging her lips, despite at the same time very tempt to eat those red hot lips voraciously. Because you are always nice with me. Am I? I ask, surprised. I never thought to have been particularly nice with her. She nods steadfast. You treat me nicely and you cuddle me and you say nice things to me. The other guys never did. They always tell me that I'm dumb and good only for one thing. She concludes, crestfallen. Do they? I ask, horrified. I mean, she is dumb and I too stay with her only for one thing, but there is no reason to tell her for God's sake. I sigh and I feel suddenly pity for her. Now I understand many things. And I kind of feel a twitch of guilt too. I could have been nicer with her after all. And maybe I shouldn't have given for granted that this interest was mutual. Okay, Moini, listen to me. I say now steadfast. You are a stunning girl. If a guy dares to tell you such a thing or to treat you unkindly, you chuck him straight away, all right? And by the way, I'm determined to find out who those bastards are. It's true I'm breaking up with her, but it's a matter of principle. You don't treat Mohini as a war. I'll teach them a lesson they won't forget in Harry. I see her about to speak, but I'm not finished yet. I'm sorry to pain you, and I'm telling the truth for once, but unfortunately we are just not suitable, and it must end. After that, it took me a good half an hour to calm her tears and convince her that I won't take back my words. A half an hour in which I felt like the worst of villains. I try to make up at best of my abilities, comforting and boosting up her self-esteem a bit. When she is a bit more composed and I don't run the risk to be accused of maltreatment, I take her back to the castle. We snog before to get to our separate common rooms. I know, I know I shouldn't have, but well, flesh is weak and those tearful eyes really got to me. It was a far west knock anyway. I feel confident in saying she understood this over. While we are exchanging our much felt goodbye, Ophelia passes by with Davis. I spot her looking at us, but when our gaze meet, she averts her eyes. Davis, however, receives me a hostile long glare to which I respond kindly with a clearly visible middle finger up on my otherwise very close fist behind Moini's shoulders, just to deliver my sentiments against his person. He flinches offended and takes Ophelia by the shoulder. Break! Well, with Moini is over, Francis will be gutted, but then, now, he is at liberty to try to hook her up, if he feels like. I received my forced declaration, and I truly broke somebody's heart for the first time. Not too bad for an evening. I'm in bed now trying to sleep and thinking dejectedly if I may be any worse to go and check the Yankee out tomorrow. I hate my bloody life. <laughs>